Okay, good morning, everyone. If you are watching the replay, welcome to the replay. If you're watching the live, welcome to the live for this week. We are talking about exercise. Um, and then we're going to go through the q and I got a lot of questions this week on my question sticker. So um, I will be answering those first. And then if we have time, I'll scroll back up to the top and uh, see if there's any questions that you guys have today. So I am going to start just, like I said, talking about exercise. Remember, none of this is medical advice. Always talk to your doctor about what could be going on for you, what's right for you, all of those things. I am not your doctor. So exercise and vestibular disorders. It's really, really important. Everyone talks about it, whether or not we wanna do it. Um, it is really important. It has been proven to be really beneficial for your vestibular disorder, regardless of what kind you have. So first of all, it is well known to decrease uh, anxiety and stress, which is really, really common with vestibular disorders, of course. So apart from just the dizziness, let's start with the anxiety and stress and depressive um, components of a vestibular disorder that can kind of all come in the same package. Um, research has been shown many, many times that exercise, um, at least in a moderate to large effect size, um, will decrease stress and anxiety with those uh, with the diagnosis of stress and anxiety. So they just took people in this particular study, people who, um, yes, I will always save the life, people who um, are diagnosed with a stress or anxiety disorder or condition, something related to that. They only took people with those conditions in this study so that they didn't just have people who were like, oh my God, I'm extra stressed out this week. Now I exercise, now I feel okay. That's not the kind of people they uh, included in these studies. So it does go to show that your anxiety, depressive and stressed symptoms will decrease with 30 minutes-ish of exercise a day. Um, it's also, really great for balance and motor control. So if you have a vestibular disorder, you might have trouble walking in a straight line, feeling balanced on uneven surfaces, feeling balanced on one leg, all of those things. And if you have trouble with those, then you need balance and motor control exercises. So that means that more than just walking or more than just let's say going to Pilates class, something like that, you actually need balance specific training, which is specific for vestibular rehab usually, and then motor control training, which we also do in physical therapy. We also do in vestibular group fit. So if you're with me in there, you know that we do a lot of control stuff with our weights um, and that is great. So people doing both um, are likely, it's likely to be better for your health and well-being in general if you're doing both regular exercise and balance and motor control training. Um, but it both will especially also reduce fatigue. Uh, but if you want help with actual balance, you have to do balance specific exercises, which I think is really interesting because just walking is not going to improve your balance. Um, so then we go to people with migraine and exercise because most of you here who tend to follow me are people with vestibular migraine or you treat vestibular migraine. So those with migraine who participate in more physical activity regardless of the type. So you can go to Pilates, you can lift weights, you can go on a walk, you can go on a jog, like whatever exercise it is that you like, um, have a reduction in frequency, intensity, and type of, uh, pain and disability. So that also includes dizziness in our case because we're talking about vestibular migraine and as we know, you do not need to have the pain part in order to be diagnosed with vestibular migraine. You can just have the vertigo, the dizziness, all of those symptoms which are incredibly debilitating. However, I say just because we're ignoring the pain part. Although many of you might also have the pain part, you aren't required to have the pain part in order to have um, vestibular migraine. So exercising at least 30 minutes a day is what's important for that. Up to 45 minutes is even better. Um, regular exercise has a prophylactic effect on migraine and some people actually say it can help them stave off a migraine that they can feel c coming. So if you know what your prodrome kind of things are, if you have head tingling or face tingling or you feel like you're starting to get extra dizzy. Everyone has four phases of migraine, prodrome, aura, headache, or impact phase, and then postdrome. So if you figure out what that prodrome thing is, some people say that taking a walk, 
doing a, a short exercise program, something like that, which is what I have created vestibular fit for. And in the a vault of all of the exercises you have just seated exercises just supine exercises and then all the exercises we did that are like standing and stuff so that there are different positions that you can in- still engage and exercise with if you don't feel like getting out of bed or you can just sit up you don't feel like laying down but you can sit and do some stuff that can help actually stave off an ex- a-, a migraine attack which is um a really big deal obviously so there's also um a lot of a lot of research to show that scaling exercise is just as important as doing the full blown exercise. So let's say you go to a really intense gym class and you're like, oh my gosh, I should not do this. Like this is too much for me. I now I just can't exercise anymore. The answer is not, I should not exercise anymore. The answer to that is, hey, let's talk to the coach and say, hey, I have something where I can't do these really crazy overhead movements. It bothers my neck. How do I scale that? And scaling is sort of a language that all good exercise coaches and physical therapists should be able to speak. So if you ask someone, hey, can you scale this for me? that usually should go well for you. So that's a good way to always ask if you are in a group setting or if you're in a personal training setting. Um, Moving on to Meniere's disease and exercise. So there is not a ton of research about why this is a thing, but in order to control Meniere's disease, there is some research and a lot of anecdotal evidence um, to say that high intensity interval training or high intensity exercise, um, biking, running, uh, weightlifting, whatever it is for you, um, can actually um, reduce your Meniere's attacks and your symptoms. So not, excuse me, not only um, does it help prevent them, but it also helps manage it. So Meniere's disease is really, um, does really affect your life and it's really unpredictable and the vertigo and spinning can really last for long, long periods of time and it can be really awful. So, um, finding ways that work for you to manage your condition, if you are a person with Meniere's disease, um, is really important. So finding a way to exercise it, to exercise yourself will, uh, help mitigate those symptoms. Sorry, my dog is doing something funky. All right. So, um, rooted behavioral education, Dr. Kostolnik, I talk about her all the time. She's great. If you don't follow her already, you should go follow her. It's at rooted behavioral education. Um, talked a lot about inflammation and exercise and VM last week. Um, and so this is kind of taking a note from her book, but I wanted to reiterate it on my platform as well. I think it's important that a lot of people with vestibular migraine also have inflammation sin- symptoms and inflammation that makes their symptoms worse. So foods like gluten and dairy are known to be pretty pro-inflammatory for most people. Most people can't tolerate that, especially if you have um, an underlying autoimmune vestibular or what have you condition. So um, talk to your doctor before you go cutting out food groups. But exercise will help reduce inflammation. So 20 to 40 minutes a day will help decrease inflammation um, and may decrease symptoms, will help decrease symptoms of dizziness, vertigo, lightheadedness, etc. Because your vestibular symptoms will increase with inflammation. So if you decrease your inflammation in any way, whether that's food, hydration, decreasing stress, getting enough exercise, all of those things will really, really help the inflammation aspect as well. Um, I also think it's important to mention that there is an excellent study that shows people who regularly participate in regular exercise. So that means just like I've been saying, walking, jogging, running, what have you, doesn't matter what it is, as long as you're doing it, you are less likely to have 3PD symptoms. So that's persistent postural perceptual dizziness, which I have so much trouble saying. So 3PD, um, they will help reduce attacks of vestibular symptoms. It will help increase your vestibular function. So your vestibular system works like a gyroscope in your head. So if you imagine your phone, which you're probably watching me on, so don't go do this, but if you are if you have your phone and you're on like Google Maps, Apple Maps, Android Maps, I don't know if that thing, whatever it is, there's a thing in your phone where if you point it one way or point it a different way, kind of like this, the cone on the direction you're moving moves to tell you where you are going down the street, wherever you are in the world. 
your vestibular system works the same way. Because if for whatever reason you're pointing your phone in a direction and it's like, oh, it's kind of going the wrong way. If you shake it, I don't know if you know this, but if you shake it, it pops up with an error message, but it also resets. So if you think about your brain in the same function as you think about the internal gyroscope on your phone, you know what the vestibular system does. So it tells you where you are in space. And the more that you move your head, the better you'll feel long term. However, the caveat to that is if you have an active vestibular disorder or dysfunction or condition or something going on, the more you move your head, if you move it too much, you'll actually feel worse and you're not helping yourself, which is why it's helpful to get uh, vestibular therapy. But people who do vestibular therapy at the same time as they do fitness, uh, whether that's, again, walking, running, jogging, biking, group classes, Pilates, like I don't care what you do, just do it. If you do those things at the exact same time as you do vestibular therapy, your outcomes are usually better. So people who are encouraged to do regular exercise at the same time as vestibular rehab do better than people who do not. So that's just another reason to move your body. Go for a 20 minute walk. A patient of mine told me that she follows someone on Instagram who calls their walks stupid walks. And it's like, I have to go on this stupid walk, but I'll feel so much better afterwards. And honestly, that's very true. Like you get out, you get in the sun, everyone feels better after that for the most part. Not always in the hot sun, but getting some fresh air is usually a good thing. So that is my spiel about exercise. Like I said, it is so, so important. If you're feeling really uncomfortable with movement or feeling like you want a supportive group of people to move with, um, I have vestibular group fit. There's more information in my bio. There's information that you can find um, in my uh, posts from the last like week-ish. Um, it's it, People are doing so well in there. I really want to give them a huge shout out. It's a really big deal. The amount of exercise they're doing, people have been making huge gains. So there's that. Just if you want to join, it is open all the time. There's no deadline, whatever. You can also always DM me. I don't know if you know this about me. I always reply to all of my DMs. I keep up on them. So uh, if you have questions, just let me know. Okay. So I did not group these questions very well today, so I'm just gonna run through them. Um, this is my quick Q and A that I got asked on my sticker, um, my stick question sticker. I don't know what you call it, the box on my story. Um, yes, group fit is virtual. It and okay, I'm gonna go ahead and explain group fit for one second. So group fit is my virtual training program. It's not personal training, it's group fitness. So three days a week, me and my colleague Jenna Green, she's great. She's also a vestibular therapist. She and I went to PT school together. She works at a clinic in Minneapolis that does only vestibular disorders. So we are like vestibular holics, which I think um, there's a person from Balancing Act Rehab that coined that term, I think, but vestibular holics for sure. Um, and we coach these classes three days a week. So it's an arms day, a legs day, and a full body day. On the days off, um, you are not always, you might want like structured exercise. So we have three days of on your work, own workouts, which are on a PDF. And then each of those exercises is hyperlinked. So if I say do step outs and you're like, what is this lady talking about? It's hyperlinked. So you can always find it. Um, and then there is also a return to brisk walking and return to run program where you kind of break down how to get back to 30 minutes of like either fast walking or slow jogging, slow, fast jogging, whatever it feels right for you. But the program is the same regardless. So um, all of those things are in group fit. They're saved for 30 days and then they're put into this vault. And if you go on my website, the vertigodoctor.com, there's a members only section where you need a password to enter. That password changes monthly and everyone who is involved for the month uh, gets that password and then you're able to see every exercise that we've ever done every program we've ever done all of those things and I think that um, that's really important so that you're able to go back and see like hey I didn't feel so good this day did I do something crazy extra because we do do vestibular challenges and balance challenges during all this time so um, it's a really good idea to at least check it out and see if it's right for you. Ask me any questions if you have them. Um, it is a really effective program. People have been having huge and great results. So um, let me know if you have any questions. All right, now to my question and answer. So my, um, awesome, I'm so excited to have you. Uh, someone says they're gonna join. So um, we're so excited to have you in group. Um, we'll see you there. 
All right, so my first question today is about eye strain. So eye strain is that feeling behind your eyes where you're like, oh my God, this, like I, my eyes feel strained. You know what it feels like, I guarantee. So there are a couple things you can do to manage eye strain. My first and favorite, hold on, is my migraine shield. So I, as you guys know, do not have migraine, but I have had a, like this weird headache thing going on for a while. Um, and these really do help. They make, it makes my eyes way less sensitive. Um, it kind of dims the light. As you can see, they're a little bit tinted. Um, they're kind of orange a little bit of an orange tint but they're but you can see through them all my colors look the same pretty much if you are a person who does like graphic design you might need to do some of this but um for the most part they're fine they're less pink than other lenses they're made by someone with vestibular migraine for people with vestibular migraine um these ones are called migraine shields there's many many different brands these ones are the least pink of all of the ones that i've seen and they're my personal favorites um i do have a discount code if you want to get them it's vertigo doc 20 it's 20 percent off they also have sales all the time if you want to participate in one of those then it's like 20 percent off 20 percent off whatever their um deal is which is great so um, again it's vertigo doc 20 all one word no capitals or anything like that um, and you can get a discount on these um, and I love them you can give them a try another way to reduce eye strain is the 10 10 rule so you can also do like 20 20 but I try 10 10 so for every 10 minutes you stare at the computer it doesn't have to be exact but do your best so let's say I'm at staring at my computer for 10 minutes whatever count to 10 but stare for 10 seconds at the wall ahead of you so like look up towards the ceiling if the ceiling's not comfortable kind of like turn find the wall stare at something that is not your computer for 10 seconds and every 10 minutes try and repeat that um that sequence because uh then it will help decrease eye strain oh question about these these are migraine shields i follow them on instagram if you want to just go to my followers when this is over um but it's at migraine shields or migraine shields.com um, so you can do those two. You can also, if eye strain is problematic because you're sensitive to the light in like the grocery store, wear a hat, um, and your glasses at the same time, I would recommend not wearing, give me one second, you go. Sorry. Um, I would recommend that you don't wear, uh, sunglasses inside. Wearing sunglasses inside can actually decrease or increase your eye sensitivity so that you become hypersensitive to sun to fluorescent lighting to everything like that and that can actually make your eye strain and eye sensitivity worse in the long run so these are okay to wear inside and outside because they only block a specific kind of blue light not all blue light which is what we're trying to do just the kind of blue light that bothers people with migraine people with heavy eye sensitivity rather than all blue light in general. So those are my best tips for eye strain. Um, if people have other tips, you can always comment uh, when this is over. If you comment right now, it will just disappear into the abyss. But if you comment when this is over, when I post it, um, that'd be great so other people can learn too. So someone asked about oscillopsia. So yes, I'm getting to that question, I promise. Okay, uh, someone asked about oscillopsia. So oscillopsia is when you see things kind of moving. Um, and that can be a result of your vestibular ocular reflex not working in the right way. So we went over this before. We're going to go over it again. If everyone sticks their thumb out with me like this, stare at your thumbnail. Now move your head like this. Keep your eyes on your thumbnail the whole time. Things behind your thumb can move, but your thumb should not move. Okay, that is your vestibular ocular reflex working. And that means that your ears are keeping your eyes still while your head moves. So if that's not working, um, you should practice that exercise. Some people get really frustrated and they say, I've been doing this for months and it doesn't help. Okay, that could definitely be happening. I 100% believe you. That often happens because there is a constant problem going on that won't let it be fixed. So if you're trying to fix something, and let's say you're trying to put something back together and a kid just comes over and keeps breaking it, then you're never gonna get that thing to fix. So if you're having a vestibular problem and you're consistently having attacks over and over and over and over again, then you're gonna keep working to try and get better, but that attack is gonna kinda keep putting you two steps back a little bit. So if you find out 
what the trigger is. And I'm not saying don't do vestibular therapy if you're having constant attacks. Some, for some people, that is the only option. And for some people, it's still effective. But if you're doing just this for four months and you're not figuring out what the other symptoms and causes of your vestibular problem are, it is really unlikely that you will feel back to 100%. This is a multi, multifaceted problem. Um, and there are many parts of a healthcare team that do need to help. Um, so someone asked a similar question, which is why am I seeing my visual field look like a boat or like it's swaying? So that means like they're, everything they say, see kind of goes like this. Also oscillopsia. Some people say when they like stare at the tiny off light on the TV, like it moves when they're at night, that can be nystagmus. It really depends. But, um, if you're seeing your visual field moving all the time, that's usually as a result of your vestibular ocular reflex. It usually be worse when you are moving, the horizon might look like it's bouncing, then you might need to do exercises like this, exercises like this, exercises like this. Um, there are a lot of different head movements that can um, help that. So someone asked, do motion sensitivity exercises help to reduce the motion triggered MDDS symptoms? Not typically. Physical therapy for MDDS is a tricky problem because MDDS the dye protocol is like the gold standard and that's when opt you do like either you say which side you feel like you're being pulled and swayed or you do the Fukada step test which you can look up that up it's called F-U-K-A-D-A Fukada step test you can see which way you turn if you turn and you watch stripes in the opposite direction while someone passively moves your head like this to a beat of about 12 beats per minute, but that depends on you and how many sways you do per minute. You can read the whole uh, study online. It's open source, it's free. Motion sensitivity exercises do not help typically MDDS. MDDS can be functionally helped, like it might be easier for you to walk down the street by doing those exercises. It might be easier for you to balance on even on, on uneven surfaces doing those kinds of exercises if you have MDDS. But the gold standard is the optokinetic stripes one way and you passively moving your head or someone passively moving your head for you um, like this to a beat. So um, the answer is yes and no. Yes for function, no for the actual swaying sensation. Um, Let's talk about supplements for migraine and vertigo. Remember, this is not medical advice. I am not giving you advice on what you should or should not take. These are just the ones that you typically hear about from people who have migraine and vestibular migraine. So they are magnesium. Money, there are so many kinds of magnesium. There's articles about it on my website. There are articles about it on the Disney Cooks website. There are so many articles about which kind of magnesium you should take. Um, most doctors say you can take up to 400 milligrams, but I would ask your doctor what is correct for you. The other one is CoQ10, and the last one that people tend to take is B2 or riboflavin. There is a company called Simple Supplements. I follow them too. They're great. I did a giveaway with them a couple months ago, um, and they have... Um, all of these that come in one, it also has um, butter burr in it, which is PA free, because um, PA isn't apparently very good for you. So they took the PA out of it, just put the regular butter burr in there and those things, plus it has like a digestive enhancer for you being able to, or an absorption enhancer of sorts. So um, that is a really great one. If you wanna go check them out, it's at Simple Supplements without the E. So S-I-M-P-L Supplements. Supplements has the E, but simple doesn't. Okay. Uh, people also want to talk about medication, so I'll do that right now after vitamins. So SNRIs and SSRIs. So that stands for serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor and selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So these all modulate the neurotransmitter serotonin, which we often think about as like a happy hormone. Um, people with migraine and same for vestibular migraine, don't have as much um, serotonin as people without. So not only do you not have enough serotonin, but the trigeminal nerve, which is the one that goes like this into your face, your trigeminal nerve um, has some like, what is it called? I wrote it down. Oh, 
receptors to some serotonin receptors that are on the trigeminal nerve and if there isn't enough serotonin available that can be part of triggering a migraine it's not necessarily the reason the migraine comes but it can be part of the reason so by taking an SSRI or an SNRI you can or tricyclic antidepressants which are another kind of um anti-depression anti-anxiety medication the most uh common tricyclic is nortriptyline which a lot of people with vestibular migraine take um about 40 percent of patients had a decrease in dizziness so um, that one is pretty effective but definitely talk to your doctor about which one's right for you because a lot of people don't like nortriptyline a lot of people prefer effexor or something else or not prefer that so different for every single person but it's good to do your own research and also to ask your doctor um people do get afraid of taking antidepressants because they're like i don't have anxiety i don't have depression i don't have stress if you have a vestibular condition even if you weren't stressed out before even if you weren't anxious before dizziness naturally makes you anxious there's a connection in your brain that just triggers this anxiety dizzy cycle that goes in a circle so even if you don't consider yourself an anxious person or a depressed person or a stressed out person vestibular dysfunction really can trigger that so that's important to know and there's also no shame in taking any of these medications it can be really scary to start taking a medication because there are side effects and some of them they can be hard to wean off of and all of these different things there isn't like a lot of long-term research on a lot of them but if it really does make you feel better and it really does increase your uh quality of life then it really is worth it to just keep taking them in most cases again i'm not your doctor don't take my medical advice this is not medical advice but it is good to be able to talk to your doctor and also to weigh all these things in your head like what is my quality of life if i'm taking this antidepressant versus not even be able to get up and move someone just asked um how can you get this information i save all of these on my igtv so if you need to watch this later it'll be saved later not a problem um so I hope that helps with the medication discussion. I don't prescribe medication. I'm a PT, I'm not that kind of doctor. I don't give people advice on what medication they should take, but I do think it's important for you to understand that there's no shame in taking a medication if it improves your quality of life and if it is better long-term for you and that is a discussion to have with you and a doctor who you trust. So um, next question is can you have all negative testing and still have a positive vestibular disorder? Yes, I think I did a post on this the other day and I did a story on it the other day. This is something I will not shut up about. I think there are a lot of those things you guys have come to learn, but this is one thing. You can have a negative VNG, a negative MRI, a negative CT, X-ray, uh, audi audiogram, ECOG, VEMP, like all of those things can be negative and you can still have a vestibular disorder. Vestibular migraine is one of those things that people tend not to believe that they have when they first get diagnosed. They're like, I've never had a headache in my life. I can't possibly have vestibular migraine. All my tests are negative. I can't possibly have a problem. That can also cause problems with healthcare providers because then some healthcare providers are like, oh, you're negative. You must be making it up. That is not true. You're negative. You must, you might still, not you must, you might still have a vestibular problem. Most commonly, with all negative testing, vestibular migraine is the problem or is the diagnosis. I can't tell you if you have this or not, but um, if you do get dizzy and all of your tests are negative and but you feel like this off thing that everyone describes, vestibular migraine is really common, especially if you have a history of migraine in your family. You don't necessarily have to have the migraine history, but someone in your family might have it and you could have gotten vestibular migraine instead of classic migraine. So yes, you can still have a vestibular disorder even though every single one of your tests is negative. Um, does every person with vestibular migraine have 3PD? No. There are some people with vestibular migraine who a couple of times a year, they get this awful vertigo attack. It's terrible. They spend a couple days kind of down for the count, resting a little bit, doing whatever they need to feel healthy because during that time, it's all about soothing, making sure you're okay, keeping down fluids and foods and things like that, and then being able to um, 
and then being able to kind of recover afterwards. So after the migraine itself kind of dissipates, some people with a little bit of vestibular rehab, a little bit of movement, sometimes some medication, sometimes some cognitive behavioral therapy, whatever, they it goes away. That happens for some people and they're not chronically dizzy and the inner ictal. So inter ictal means between attacks. They're not chronically dizzy between the two attacks. That means that there isn't a, that means that they don't have 3PD. So the 3PD guidelines and diagnostic criteria are all over my Instagram page because I think it's really important for people to know that A, you can't have 3PD without an underlying diagnosis and B, 3PD does not necessarily mean or VM does not necessarily mean you have 3PD and they are two separate diagnoses and I'm working on a post about this too um, because they're not the same VM can cause 3PD 3PD does not mean you have VM you could have vestibular neuritis or Meniere's disease and have 3PD but not all people with vestibular dysfunction even have 3PD so it's important to remember that um someone wants to know the number one thing you can do to prevent migraine um oh someone just asked again what's the number one thing to help with vm okay i don't know if you asked this on my question sticker too or if it was someone else but regardless it's clearly a popular question there is not one thing that you can do like to treat this to manage it however the best recommendation that i can give you is to track your symptoms at least short term tracking your symptoms long term can be kind of debilitating because then you're like people get really obsessed with What's the weather? What uh, food am I eating? How much? I don't know what my sound my dog's making. I'm sorry. What food am I eating? How much water am I drinking? Did I have something go out of whack yesterday? What are my stress levels like? All those things are really important to consider. However, people can tend to get hypersensitive to those things. So I think that tracking short term, maybe two weeks up to maybe four weeks is a good uh, boundary there to give yourself and if you can't find draw any conclusions by that time then that's okay um but that is the number one thing that i recommend then you can also go give it to your provider whether that's a pt or a medical doctor whatever kind of doctor you're going to um and they might be able to help you draw some conclusions as well is tingling and pins and needles normal feeling with migraine? For some people it is, especially just on the top of your head. It's called allodynia. I know it's really uncomfortable, but it is. it can be normal for some people. Um, okay, what is the reason that there is hearing loss? Can I talk about hearing loss? So hearing loss, because your vestibular system, if you Google vestibular system, you'll notice that it's connected to this other half of something, and that is your cochlea. So your cochlea is your hearing organ, your vestibular system is your balancing organ, the two are connected. They're really curly, half of it looks like a snail, half of it looks like three canals. The three canals side is your vestibular system, the snail side is your cochlea. Your cochlea is of course responsible for hearing in some diseases such as Meniere's disease, such as um, superior canal dehiscence syndrome or um, yeah, SCDS and SSCD, those things and labyrinthitis and sometimes vestibular migraine can give you some hearing loss. The trick when you're looking at hearing loss is to see if it is constant or it's acute if it's just during an attack, you might have Meniere's disease. It's a low frequency hearing loss. That means it's on the left side of the chart on one side. And so if you're seeing a dip on just one side of the chart, it's uneven from your other side. If something is ever unilateral or uneven, that's when you know, hey, something's up. I don't care if it's knee pain that's uneven. I don't care if it's your hearing that's uneven. If something is uneven, you have to look for a problem because Unless you worked for 25 years at a really huge music venue and you only had music going into one side of your ear that was like really loud all the time, there's no reason you should have unilateral hearing loss. Hearing loss happens bilaterally, which means both sides. So things that can give you unilateral hearing loss, low frequency 
is Meniere's disease across the board, I think frequency labyrinthitis, which is the same as vestibular neuritis. However, it happens in both nerves. So your vestibular nerve and your cochlear nerve kind of split like this at the end, right before it gets to your cochlea and vestibular system. And then they come together to go towards the brain. So if you get a, an infection in just your vestibular nerve, then it'll be just your vestibular function. But if the infection comes up here where it is more connected, then you'll have both hearing loss and a vestibular problem. So those are um, important things. Someone says they had an inverted eardrum with vestibular neuritis. They couldn't figure out why. I don't know about that either, but sometimes your eardrum, if you have a pressure problem in your inner ear because of your eustachian tube, um, which is what regulates pressure, it's why you pop your ears when you go down on an airplane or you scuba dive or you change elevations. Um, if you didn't regulate, if some for some reason there wasn't a regulation of pressure in your ear, your uh, eardrum can get sucked in towards your um inner ear basically um, which cannot be comfortable i cannot imagine uh, i'm not sure why that happened with neuritis i wish i could give you better information um okay someone wants to know if there are a reason for hormones relating to vertigo so i did a little bit of research on this just so i could give you a better answer um there are reasons that this happens um i Oh, someone else had this happen. But it's just before I start with hormones, inverted eardrums with neuritis. Honestly, I, you guys, I do have never heard of that. And thank you for teaching me. I will have to look into this. Um, I'm really not sure what's going on with that. Um, so hormones relating to vertigo. Hormones relating to vertigo usually is with migraine because fluctuations of estrogen can lead to migraine um, that's why some people it is really cyclical with like their period with menstruation and it's a lot of times migraine goes away with um with pregnancy because at the very beginning there's a lot of hormone fluctuation but by like the second or third trimester it tends to go away um, and that's why that happens because there are less fluctuations of estrogen during menopause it happens to it tends to get worse because uh, periods are infrequent and or really frequent and they kind of are sporadic and that can be really irritating um but basically the change in estrogen is what causes differences in um in hormone fluctuations which can cause problems with uh, migraine for whatever reason, hormone replacement therapy, there isn't a ton of research on this, and I'm not sure if it's because it doesn't work. I couldn't really find the answer. If it's because it doesn't work or if it just hasn't been researched yet, um, something that I'm still trying to look into because a lot of people ask me if birth control um, helps or hinders migraine, and honestly, I cannot find the answer. So if anyone knows, I would love the research. <laughs> um, I can ask around a little bit. Also, um, what about breastfeeding after pregnancy? Some people say it helps. Some people say it doesn't help. It's really dependent. Um, I wish I knew a better answer to that one too. Okay, last question I think is what tools can I buy for vestibular rehab at home? So vestibular rehab, you can really do it with things that you don't really need anything. You can, I do everything via telehealth and I've had a lot of success with that because you really don't need any tools. It, the tools just make it easier for you sometimes. So the one thing, if you have issue with convergence, which is when you stick your thumb out and you follow your thumb in, you go cross-eyed. I don't know if you can see, but I'm cross-eyed. Um, if you go cross-eyed in and out like that, that can, um, that can be easier with something called a Brock string, which is basically a string with three beads on it. Um, and you just kind of go in and out with that. You can ask your PT or your vision therapist how to do that. Um, but there aren't a ton of tools that you need. So basically the most popular exercises that you do in vestibular rehab are this one, VOR time one, VOR times two, vestibular can oh VOR cancellation, which is like this, and then walking with head turns. I mean, there are so many exercises that we use, but those are like the standard ones um, that people kind of go to. And if your vestibular therapist only ever gives you those ones and doesn't really help, uh, it might be why. Um, because you do need more than just those. 
Am I taking new patients for telehealth? Yes, absolutely I am. I would love to have you. I am licensed in New Jersey, New York, Virginia, Maryland, and California. You just need to reside in those in one of those states and I can treat you. Um, I would love to be your PT. Um, we thought my Meniere's disease would be more manageable after my pregnancy, but I'm still suffering episode after episode, and I'm wondering if nursing is playing a part in my ENT couldn't say. I really wish I knew too. I'm sorry. I wish that I had uh, better advice about that. Hmm. I'll look into it and see if I can find anything, but I am honestly not sure. I wish I had a better answer. Um... Okay, if there are no more questions, that is all for today. It was so great to talk to you all, as always, and I will see you guys at 9 a.m. next week.